Now this morning, I want to talk to you about a simple two-letter word, the word in, spelled I-N. Now we use this word in our common speech all the time, and we really don't think much about it. By itself, this word has no particular significance. But when it's combined with other words in the words and the word of God in the Bible, its significance can be enormous. I'm going to look at the significance of that little word in within the two passages of scripture that we just read, John 3.16 and John 5.24. Now, both of these texts are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Both of these texts describe the conditions of salvation. They tell what a person must do to receive the gift of eternal life and also to avoid the condemnation of eternal hell. Listen as I read them again to you from the NIV. And by the way, I'm using the old NIV. What we had on the screen was the new NIV. It's a little bit different, but it's basically the same. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then John 5.24, which is actually my favorite gospel verse, I tell you the truth, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Now, did you catch how Jesus describes the condition of salvation in John 3.16? He says that God will give eternal life to whoever believes in him, that is, whoever believes in Jesus. But in John 5.24, he describes it a little bit differently. He says that God will give the gift of eternal life to whomever believes the message which God the Father sent to mankind through the Son, Jesus Christ. The differences here actually are significant. John 3.16 says that believing in Jesus is the key to eternal life. And John 5.24 says that believing the message of the Father is the key to eternal life. In John 3.16, it's believing in a person. In John 5.24, it's believing a message. We seem to have a disagreement here, and yet we know that God never contradicts himself. So today I want to explore these verses with you. I want to look at the differences between believing in and believing. And doing so will help us to better understand the conditions that an individual must meet in order to receive the gift of eternal life. We're going to see that what you believe and also whom you believe are so important that they determine whether or not God will give any individual the gift of eternal life. So let's start by addressing uh, John 3.16. Let me read it to you again. I tend to be repetitious in my teaching and preaching. I hope you don't mind. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The key words here are whoever believes in him. The key issue in John 3.16 is what we believe in. Now, this question of what you believe in is a common one. You might ask a little child, do you believe in Santa Claus? And if the child says yes, that means that the child believes that Santa Claus exists, that he's a real person. Or I might ask a group of you as individuals in this room, do you believe in man-made climate change? And some of you would say yes, and some of you might say no. When we ask the question, do you believe in such and such, the question really means, do you believe that such and such exists, that it is part of reality? Now, on a more serious note, I might ask a person this question, do you believe in God? Now, for the first two decades of my life, if someone asked me that question, I would say absolutely not. I was, as I considered myself to be, an atheist. An atheist is, is a person who denies the existence of God. Now, on the other hand, a theist is a person who believes that God does exist. 
And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are obviously a theist. But having said that, it's vital that we be clear that simply believing in God, believing in the existence of God, is not enough for anyone to be saved. The world is full of people who believe in God but aren't saved. For example, Muslims, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, they all believe in the existence of an eternal God, and they might even say that they believe in the God of the Bible. Yet anyone who claims to believe in God, but who rejects Jesus Christ, remains unsaved. And we'll come back to the reasons for that later. So summarizing what we've seen so far, in John 3.16, Jesus says that in order to be saved, an individual must believe in him. But when he says that whoever believes in him will be saved, he means more than simply acknowledging the fact of his existence, the fact that he was a historical person, that kind of thing. And that observation leads us to John 5, 24. So once again, in John 3, 16, the question was raised, what do you believe? Do you believe in Jesus as a real person? But in John 5, 24, the question is different. Here the question is, whom do you believe? Whom do you believe? Listen again, John 5, 24. I tell you the truth, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Now I want to focus on seven aspects of this statement by Jesus because it's a very rich statement. I'm going to list them for you and then we'll look at them one at a time. Number one, the certainty of the statement. Number two, the role of Jesus. Number three, the message from the Father. Number four, the condition of the promise. Number five, the possession of the believer. Number six, the security of the believer. And number seven, the arrival of the believer. There's a lot here. Well, first of all, let's consider the certainty of this statement that Jesus makes. If you were to look at a number of different Bible translations, you would see that they all emphasize the certainty of this statement. The NIV has, I tell you the truth. The New King James Version, which I usually preach from, says, most assuredly. The NET Bible says, I tell you the solemn truth. These are all ways of expressing in English this emphatic um, declaration by Jesus that what he is about to say is absolutely and certainly true. Well, second, we come to the role of Jesus. Jesus says, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me. Now, if you stop and think about it, what is Jesus doing? He's describing his role as the role of a prophet. He brings a message from the Father. In John chapter 12, verses 49 to 50, he says the same thing even more clearly. Listen, he says, I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that the command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father told me, so I speak. During his time on earth, Jesus performed the role of a prophet. He brought a message from the Father. And that takes us to the third aspect of John 5.24, the message of the Father. The message of the Father includes everything that Jesus taught and really everything that's revealed in Scripture. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, the book begins this way. God, at various times, in various ways, spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. God first spoke to mankind through the Old Testament prophets and writers but Christ has brought us the most full message from the Father. So now we come to aspect number four of John 5.24, the condition of the promise. Jesus tells us that the promise of eternal life applies to, and here I quote him, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me. Now think about the two verbs here. 
one must hear. In other words, he must be exposed to the message that Jesus brings. But that's not enough. One must also believe. In other words, he must accept the message that Jesus brings from the Father as true. Now, this is where we come to the significance of that little word, in. In John 3.16, the call was to believe in Jesus. And without the clarification that comes from John 5.24, we might not really know what it means to believe in Jesus. In John 5.24, we come to the real heart of the matter. The condition of eternal life, the condition that each individual must meet in order to receive God's gift of eternal life, is to not just believe in the existence of God, not just to believe in Jesus as a historic person. The condition is believing God. Let me say that again. The condition of eternal life is believing God. God will give the gift of eternal life to any particular individual under only one condition, and that's it. The individual must hear the Father's message, and he must believe the message. He must accept it as true. Now, hold on to that idea. We will come back to it at the end of this message, why it's so important that we believe the message. Well, the fifth aspect of John 5.24 is the possession of the believer. Notice what Jesus says. If you hear and believe, you have eternal life. Now, what is God's gift of eternal life? It includes many things. Negatively, it's the promise that one will not perish. One will not be condemned to eternal hell when he dies. But positively, the promise of eternal life means that after physical death, the believer's soul and spirit will be received into the Father's presence. It means that ultimately, Every believer will receive a new, glorious, eternal, immortal resurrection body. And I have to tell you that when I think about the resurrection body, I'm getting old enough that my body is starting to, you know, have a few problems. The big question I have is this. Will my resurrection body have hair? <laughs> I, I wonder about that. I haven't found the answer in the Bible. Um, if you have truly heard the Father's message through the Son... And if you truly believe it, all of the things that are included in the promise of eternal life belong to you now in the sense that you are guaranteed that you will receive them. Now, aspect six of John 5.24 is the security of the believer. And this is really wonderful if you think about it. Notice what Jesus says. He says, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. Notice the tenses of the verb. The believer has everlasting life the moment that he believes the Father's message. It's a present possession that he gets at that moment. The believer will not be condemned. It simply can't happen. If you're saved today, it is impossible that tomorrow or at any time in the future you will lose the gift of eternal life because God doesn't break his promises. Listen to John chapter 10, verses 28 to 29. Jesus says, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Paul made the same point in Romans chapter 8 regarding the believer when he wrote these words, and they're sobering words. Paul says, I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, if you have heard and believed God's message, you are secure in your salvation. That doesn't mean you should live your life carelessly, but it does mean that you can trust God's promise. You will never be condemned. 
God doesn't break his promises. Now, finally, we come to the seventh aspect of John 5, 24, and I call this the arrival of the believer. Listen again. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Crossed over from death to life. I love this verse because Jesus tells us here that if you believe, you have been rescued from the finality of death. You haven't been rescued from the reality of physical death, but you've been rescued from the finality of death because if you die not having received God's gift of eternal life, he will send you to hell. And I know we don't like to talk about that very much, but Jesus talked more about hell than anybody else in the entire Bible. If you have believed, you have arrived in the sense that the finality of death is no longer a problem for you. I'm afraid of the process of dying, honestly. It scares me. But I'm not afraid of what's on the other side. And that's the most important thing. All right? Our Lord Jesus, he's like a bridge who carries the believer from the certainty of eternal condemnation into the certainty of eternal life. Do you remember these words of his from John 14, 6? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's like a bridge. So if you have crossed that bridge, you have eternal life now. If you have crossed that bridge in the most important sense, you have arrived. And if you haven't crossed that bridge, it's something you need to think about today. Now with that examination of John 5.24 behind us, I want to turn to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 7. In these verses, Paul tells us exactly what it is that we must believe in order to receive the gift of eternal life. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and after that he was seen by Cephas, then by the Twelve, after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and then Paul finally adds, then last of all, he was seen by me. Now let me paraphrase Paul's words here for you. In order to be saved, one must believe what the Bible calls the good news, or in older language, the gospel. The gospel is a particular message regarding Jesus. It's the fact that Jesus accomplished the events that are recorded in that message I just read to you, that he died bearing our sins to pay our sin debt to the Father. He truly died. He was truly buried. And then he rose from the dead in resurrection life to show us what we would one day receive. Now, I want to pull together John 3.16 and John 5.24. In John 3.16, Jesus calls us to believe in him and what he accomplished by giving himself for our sins when he went to the cross. He's referring to what Paul calls the gospel. But did you notice something about John 5.24? This is very interesting. John 5.24, which is the words of Jesus, mentions nothing about the cross. The cross is not mentioned in John 5, 24. Jesus simply says that if we believe God, he will give us the gift of eternal life. Now listen to me carefully. There's no contradiction between John 3, 16 and John 5, 24. Together, they give us the bigger picture. But in John 5, 24, Jesus reveals not only how we who live after the cross must be saved, 
But he also explains how people who lived before the cross were saved. And perhaps you've wondered about this. Do you ever wonder about this? Could a person who lived before the cross be saved by believing in the death and resurrection of Jesus? Obviously not. It hadn't happened yet. So that leaves us with a question. How were people who lived before the cross saved? I want to pursue the answer to this question by eliminating some of the possibilities. Well, first of all, we know that no one could ever be saved by doing good deeds. The Bible makes it clear that we are all sinful. It makes it clear that we have all sinned. We all bear guilt for our sins. And even when we do good things, our good deeds can't erase the guilt that we already have. If I was driving here to church today and I was late and a policeman pulled me over for speeding, could I say to him, officer, I know I was speeding for the last 10 minutes, but for the previous two hours, I was driving 10 miles under the speed limit. Does that cancel? You know that wouldn't work, okay? Romans 3.20, Paul says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be saved, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Law exposes sin, but law does not deal with the guilt of sin. The law has the power to condemn us, but it doesn't have the power to save us, to bring us forgiveness. Um, we also can't be saved by animal sacrifices. Now, in the Old Testament times, the Israelites brought animal sacrifices to God. Did those sacrifices bring them salvation? No, they really didn't. I think they were a teaching tool to help people understand about the coming sacrifice of Christ. Hebrews 10.4 eliminates that possibility when it says it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. So it's clear that neither good deeds nor sacrifices could provide salvation to anyone before the cross. And yet we know that people like Abraham, like Moses, like David, we know that they were saved. They couldn't believe the gospel of Jesus Christ because he hadn't yet come. So how were they saved? Well, Jesus gives us the answer here in John 5, 24. That takes us back to the difference between believing in God and believing God. Romans chapter 4 helps us to see this clearly. Let me read to you a few verses from Romans chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Paul says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something of which to boast, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. Now that last statement, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness, comes from Genesis chapter 15. You might know the story of that chapter. God promised to give Abraham a son, but Abraham still didn't have a son. God took him outside. He said, look at the stars, count the stars. Your descendants are going to be of that number. And the next thing that the text says is that Abraham believed God and God credited it to him for righteousness. Now, Abraham met the condition of John 5, 24, didn't he? God gave him a message and he believed it. And therefore, God bestowed upon him the gift of eternal life. Now, do you see what's happening here? John 5, 24 lays out a condition of salvation that is timeless. It works before the cross. It works after the cross. For Abraham, the message that he had to believe was God's promise of a son. For others who lived before the time of the cross, the message they had to believe was whatever God had already revealed in Scripture that was known to them. For us who live after the cross, the message that we must believe is what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the fact that we are all sinners, the fact that every one of us deserves eternal condemnation, and the fact that Jesus paid the debt of our sins as individuals so that we can be saved. 
But if we don't believe that message, God will not bestow the gift of eternal life upon us. So here we come back to the significance of that little word, in. Merely believing in God, that is in believing in the existence of God, has never been enough to gain the gift of eternal life. God's condition of salvation is that we must believe him. We must believe the message that he has sent to us, and that message is right here. It's only in the Bible that we find God's message to us. Now think about what happened in the fall. If you've read the story of Genesis chapter 3, you know that in Genesis chapter 2, God gave the command, do not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then in Genesis chapter 3, Satan comes in in the form of a snake, and he convinces Adam and Eve to eat of the fruit. Now, he says, did God say you can't eat of the fruit of the tree of life? And Eve says, no, no, no. He didn't say that, but he did say we can't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan bluntly says, God was wrong. You won't die. And then what did Adam and Eve do? They ate the fruit. You know what they just did? They were declaring that Satan was telling the truth and God was lying. Stop and think about that a minute. Death came to the human race. God kept his promise. He said, in the day that you eat of it, you will die. Now, death came in stages. First, their relationship with God was broken. Then I think the next morning, Eve got up and looked in the mirror and she said, gee, there's a wrinkle there that wasn't there before. The process of physical death began and it was unavoidable. Genesis chapter 5, you read it again, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. Every human being who's ever lived has died. Even Jesus died. But then he showed us that there's a way beyond death. You see, death came to the human race when Adam and Eve declared that God was a liar. So it's no surprise that God offers us the gift of eternal life on the condition that we reverse that position, right? What's the condition of eternal life? It's that we believe God. It's that we believe he is a truth teller. That's what it means to have faith in God. Faith in God is the choice to believe that God is telling the truth and to live by that choice. That's the point of John 5, 24. Now, we have one last question to resolve that I brought up earlier. Here's the question. Is it possible to believe God while rejecting his son? And the answer is no. In 1 John 5, 12, the apostle John makes this point clear when he says, he who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. Peter makes the same point in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, when he says, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. Jesus made that point in John 14, 6, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So I conclude my message with a question for each one of you. And I hope you'll think about this question seriously. Do you believe God? Not do you believe in God, but do you believe God? This book contains a message from God to you. It's a message of his love for you, but it's also a message about his holiness and justice. You and I are sinners. Some of us sin more and some sin less, but we all sin. Our sin is an offense to God, our creator. And without his mercy and his forgiveness, every one of us deserves eternal condemnation. God offers us his forgiveness and the gift of eternal life, but that offer comes with a condition. 
Listen again to John 3.16 and John 5.24. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 5.24, I tell you the truth. He who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. So I come back to the all-important question. Do you believe God? Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins, that he was buried, that he rose from the dead to prove that his sacrifice had been accepted by God the Father? Do you believe that that is a fact of history, that it was verified by witnesses? Do you believe when God says that without his mercy and forgiveness, you deserve eternal condemnation. If you answer that question, no, my prayer is that God will not give you peace until you change your mind and answer that question, yes. Because this is the most important question that you will ever answer. Life is short. Any of us could die on the way home in a car wreck or a heart attack. We could be hit by a meteor. All kinds of things could happen, and I'm not trying to make you panic, but the reality is that we all know people who aren't here anymore. Death came to them and will come to each one of us. If you can answer yes to the question, do you believe God, I urge you, to rejoice and continue to learn what he says here. You will find that it is the greatest guide for your daily life. You will find purpose and meaning. Believing God is the most important thing. All right, will you pray with me? And I would appreciate it if you would all close your eyes because I do want to offer a challenge, and I don't want any of you to feel uncomfortable. Father, we have read the clear message that you have given to us, which is that each of us needs salvation and that you have made salvation available to each one of us. And yet the gift is not automatic. You have promised that you would give it to any of us on the simple condition of believing you. Father, I do not know many of the people in this room, but you know them, you know their hearts, you know their minds. I think it's quite possible that there are some here who have never committed themselves to you by believing you. Father, I pray, if there is anyone here like that, that at this very moment, you would cause him or her to surrender to you and say, yes, God, what you say about me is true. I am a sinner. I need your mercy. And at this very moment, I believe you. Give me the gift of eternal life. If there's anyone here who would like to do this, I would just ask you very quietly to raise your hand. I'm not going to identify you or call you to the front of the room, but I do want to aim my prayers in my heart at you. Is there anyone here who would like to tell the Father today, I believe you? Okay. I see several of you, and I'm very grateful for your courage and your willingness. Let me pray for you now and for the rest of you who already know Christ, I ask you to pray for them at this moment. Father, this is a day of salvation for the several people who have raised their hands today. They have declared today that they believe you. I'm so glad that you have opened their minds and their hearts to believe the truth of your word. And Father, I ask for them that from this day forward, they will experience your guidance, your love, that they will dig into your word, and as they study, they will be encouraged, rebuked, 
corrected and trained to know the truth and to follow you. Father, for those in this church who already know Christ, I pray that they would uh, find encouragement from those who already walk with Christ. And I pray that together the members of this body would grow into the Lord Jesus Christ as they serve each other and use their spiritual gifts and encourage each other. Thank you again, Father, that this is a day of salvation here at New Hope. We praise you and thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.